Well, first of all, you know, Rick, uh, wh wh what we're doing right now is there was a comment that was made. This is 20 years off. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. It's here right now. We have a different kind of finalmente for you tonight. In case you were thinking we would finish this newscast without a mention of Halloween. Did you think that? I thought to myself, ain't going to do it. Ain't going to do it. Ain't going to do something on Halloween. And then this story crossed. We have to. It's about ghost particles. And we just couldn't help ourselves. So we're going to do it for you. We're going to show you this story. Actually, we're sending out our princess of mystery and intrigue on this one. Here is Artie's Natasha Sweet. It might not be the scare you're looking for on this Halloween, but intriguing nonetheless. A mysterious particle yet to be confirmed is bringing excitement to a group of scientists out of Switzerland. Certain researchers at a physics lab near Geneva are investigating the possibility of a new unexpected ghost particle. Scientists say the unknown particle may have appeared during experiments while using the Large Hadron Collider. The machine detector has pointed out bumps in their data, and these unknown bumps are said to be more than double the mass of a carbon atom. The interesting part is some scientists believe there isn't a theory at the moment that includes this mysterious particle. George Wiegelin, a German theorist, says it's something being looked into at the moment. He says this does not exclude the possibility that such a signal could actually exist. On the contrary, it would be even more exciting if a signal were observed that does not seem to fit into our present models. While more experiments are still in the works, it's a possibility this ghost particle could be a new discovery. Senior scientists will be discussing their work publicly on Thursday about the undiscovered bumps. Scientists say if this discovery is confirmed by ATLAS, it will be considered real and possibly something completely revolutionary. With recent advancements in genetic engineering, the reality of creating your ideal baby is closer than ever before, if you wish. Britain's fertility regulator is to look into claims that a number of doctors have been secretly allowing couples to choose their baby's gender for a fee. The practice is illegal in the UK unless it's for medical reasons. Prospective parents already use DNA testing to check for potential genetic abnormalities that could lead to serious conditions. While critics say the manipulation of DNA poses huge ethical and moral concerns, the method is garnering the support of lawmakers and medical experts. While controversial technology could help prevent a baby of having certain genetic defects, critics are saying the implications could have a far worse effect on society. In July, the UK Ethics Council calling the practice morally permissible as long as it's in the best interest of the child. But as technology advances, others worry that we may be able to also learn about characteristics that have less bearing on the future health of the child and more on the physical and intellectual traits. You also get into issues like, is it ethical to want a, a child with blonde hair blue eyes? Maybe, maybe not. Is it ethical to want uh, a girl over a boy? Is it ethical to want somebody taller versus somebody shorter? You know, and, and so, but the, the, the list can keep going on and on and on. So, where do you draw that line? The late Stephen Hawking believed that the advances in genetic science could lead to an elite class of physically and intellectually powerful people if rich people chose to edit their DNA and manipulate their children's makeup. Well, newspaper reports claim that some couples have paid up to £14,000 for the illegal procedure. Several senior doctors allegedly set up appointments at private clinics in the UK before arranging to complete the medical treatment abroad in countries like Cyprus, Greece and the UAE. Well, we got the thoughts of Josephine Quintavalli, who's the founder of Comment on Reproductive Ethics, and political activist first, Kate Smirthwaite. There are medical conditions which either only affect boys or only affect girls and it's actually fairly standard practice in lots of places around the world for couples who have a family history of those kind of conditions to be given IVF and given the opportunity to select the gender of child that is less likely to suffer from those conditions. I think we would all take steps to try and make sure that our children were less likely to have problems later in life in all sorts of different ways. The idea of just choosing the sex of your child based on a whim, I think, you know, I think to me it sounds horrible 
terrifying, but what we should be asking really is the question, what kind of culture are we living in if people have a really strong feeling? If people really, really only want a boy, um, should we be forcing those people to have a girl? Do we want a girl raised in a family that really only wants a boy and in a culture that evidently values boys much more strongly? You know, here at RT, we believe that uh, by following the tech beat, we get a, give ourselves and you a glimpse into our lives and what's, what it's going to be like in the future. Yesterday, we tackled the issue of pre-selecting what our children would look like, or designing babies, as uh, some call it. Well, today we reveal something that is rather worrisome, especially in light of the move toward wearables and implanted devices in, in, inside of our bodies for medical reasons. One example is that of a device applied to the brain of patients with Parkinson's. The problem? Hackers. Now you mentioned before in a conversation about offing somebody, hmm. removing somebody, dispatching somebody, expurgating them, ruining them. That, 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 was, that, was a Saudi, that was a Saudi Arabia story. Right. Let's assume that this particular individual is one out of 200,000 Americans, people here, who get, let's say, call this just a pacemaker. And I don't have to go and have some kind of a hit team. Oh. I don't need to use a bone saw and dissolve somebody in acid. I just, and you're done. You're finished. Now, ultimately, think about this. Yeah. What makes Rick Sanchez Rick Sanchez is your memory, yeah. your perspective, what you saw. The worst thing that we could ever do is to ablate and remove memory. You know, they say that history would be a wonderful thing if only it were true, which is what Tolstoy <laughs> said. But if I could go in and I could, instead of taking Rick Sanchez human being, yeah. I look at you as an integrated circuit covered in a carbon a shell, uh -huh. and you become basically the ultimate Manchurian candidate. Since the days of MKUltra, Rick, it has always been the desire to control people, to have, forget, robots. Forget General Dynamics and all of that, or, or Boston Dynamics. Imagine I control you, and I can control you with just the twist of a dial and the implantation of an electrode, and it's going to happen right now. Who's watching this? Who is protecting against this, I ask you, sir? Author Yuval Noah Hariri makes a compelling argument for this case in his latest book. He predicts the next species in human evolution will be Homo Deus, AKA man god. Science and technology have already allowed us to tinker with our genes and blend our bodies with technology. Someday, natural selection, which has driven evolution thus far, may soon be replaced by deliberate selection. Jesse, this sounds like something out of a sci fi movie. What do you think about humans evolving into a species of man gods? In other words, a species that plays god by tinkering with nature? Well, uh, young Frankenstein comes to mind with Gene Wilder. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a scary thing when they start talking about this because that's in essence what you're kind of talking about here, aren't we? Yeah. Frankenstein, you know, creating people, man creating people. Uh, how is this going to fly with the spiritual community or the people that believe in God? BCIs may soon cure humans of neurological injuries, paralysis, and even diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Brain-computer interfaces connect computers to the nervous system. They come in the form of non-invasive wearable devices like helmets and implantable neuroprosthetics like brain chips. Industry leaders predict that brain chips will not only provide cures, but that they will also one day enhance human cognition, memory, and intelligence. Two leading companies in the space include Elon Musk's Neuralink and Brian Johnson's Kernel. Neuroprosthetics have already stopped tremors in subjects with Parkinson's disease and restored limb functionality in test patients with paralysis. Again, it could be a great thing, but the people that get these chips in their heads how do they know for certain who's got control of that chip? How do they know that chip couldn't turn you into a robot, turn, turn you into a Manchurian candidate? Remember, along with all the good things, behind the curtain evil will be lurking, and someone will be there to use this for bad. 
rather than good. And I think that's what we really have to be afraid of. Would I get a chip in my head? Very unlikely. We should do everything possible to protect ourselves and prevent any of these new technologies, especially the ones that are invasive, correct? Correct, and we also need to understand something. One thing in particular, you know, a lot of young folks, God bless them, they look at robots and they confuse robotics yeah. with artificial intelligence. The two are completely different. If I can go a step further, what if I use you, mm -hmm. Rick Sanchez's brain, yeah. to park data, like I would instead of putting data on a phone, I park it in you. You haven't even begun to see what we're looking at, not 20 years from now, but right now, my well, friend. Uh, you right know, now. Wait, wait. But anything that may start out being good can quickly end up being evil if the wrong people get control of it. So to me, that's the scariest thing about this is yes, it may all do all sorts of good things, but what's it going to do when it gets in the hands of the evil guy who is going to then exploit it on humanity? Yeah. If they turn us into man gods, then what will be the purpose of us believing in God then? Well, do you think if that it'll lead like to God? In, do you think it'll just end. wipe out all of those religious people or potentially uh, people who live in poverty because maybe they won't uh, be able to afford these technologies that can upgrade their genes, or people may just self-selectively choose not to move forward with this, and therefore they could disappear from the human species. A lot of things could happen as a result of this. We could end up with a more perfect society, but again, who runs these genes? Who's going to be in charge of all this stuff? This is scary stuff to me when we start tinkering with Mother Nature and all that, but it's man. We're always going to do it. It's in our genes. We always thirst for knowledge, thirst for knowledge. Let me repeat that. And so when we travel into space, we're always looking to go now beyond the moon. Right. We got to go farther out there. That's what man does. And can man end up being his own worst enemy? We might find out in this.